responsibility for the erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir. What I'd like to drive at, or ask you to explain to us, is what is the strategy now of your government to restore a degree of normalcy in the territory, to rebuild confidence, reestablish civil, political rights? How do you move forward from where you've been to where you'd like to be? How do we get there? Okay. Uh, to answer that question, uh, I'd like to explain to you what was the thought process behind August 5, because that would then uh, answer a lot of what you asked me. Now, the thought process was this. Uh, I think many of you who know Indian history will recall that there were about 600 or princely states at the time of uh, independence who were uh, given a choice of joining India or Pakistan, and uh, or most of them made up their minds. Uh, one which held out uh, in, in their session at that point of time was the state of Jammu and Kashmir. And at that time, Pakistan uh, tried to force the issue by really uh, invading uh, Kashmir. And that uh, decision went the other way, which was uh, Jammu and Kashmir decided to join India instead of Pakistan. Now, the first point which I'd like you to uh, recall is all the states joined the Indian Union in exactly the same terms and conditions. Uh, that they actually had a form. I, I have a picture of the accession, uh, instrument of accession that the Maharaja of Kashmir signed. All of them had a form, the mm -hmm. blank parts of the form where the name of the state, the name of the ruler, the date of accession. Otherwise, it was exactly the same. Now, initially when they joined, all of them agreed uh, that they would see to the union the rights, uh, you know, the powers on foreign affairs, defense, and communications. And then, as the Indian Constitution uh, came into being, uh, you know, the, the idea was that uh, they would, uh, each one of them, uh, accede to the Constitution in question. And they were participants in the Constitution making process. So, as they acceded, they sent delegates. In. So, it was like a Philadelphia convention where, you know, people then sent uh, their delegates as the convention progressed. And Jammu and Kashmir also sent uh, their delegates. Now, the situation in Jammu and Kashmir was peculiar for a number of reasons. And one of them was the fact, of course, that they were a border state, but also that they were themselves under uh, attack at that time. So, they, they, they had a desire to uh, extend the period of alignment with the rest of India uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the application of laws. Uh, and uh, the Constituent Assembly recognized that they were a very special case at that point of time. But there was then a big debate, so which parts of the Constitution do you accept and at, you know, what length of time would that take place? So this was not a simple decision. There was a lot of negotiation on it, you know, we looked, there's a lot of correspondence on it, and all of this is actually uh, archival material today. Now, to cut a long story short, what happened at that time was that for to accommodate them, the only temporary article of the constitution was drafted. Okay, I underline this, the only temporary article. And this was what today we call Article 370, at that point it was uh, numbered Article 306A. Now, immediately after that article was, the constitution was adopted, you had a series of presidential proclamations under that article, which started aligning the state. Okay. Uh, in the last 70 years, you had 54 of these presidential proclamations. But here's what went wrong. Uh, the presidential proclamations were very rapid in the initial years, but as uh, you know, there was a climate of intimidation and separatism in Kashmir, they started to dry up. They started to dry up because the state politics was now, you know, uh, people found that there was an arbitraging possibility using the separate, you know, the, the 370 article because 370 essentially uh, mandated, uh, you know, one of the consequences of 370 was you had local ownership of property. So you had, uh, you know, which was a provision of another provision of the constitution called 35 uh, And there were restrictions in many ways of what would be normal economic activity in the state. Uh, so uh, over a period of time, you had really three consequences. 
Number one, you didn't have the economic activity and economic energy in Kashmir, in Jammu and Kashmir that you had in the rest of India. Which meant less jobs, less job opportunities, more <coughs> sense of alienation, a sense of separatism and therefore a climate for terrorism from across the border. The second was that the, the, the state was in socio-economic terms increasingly uh, less aligned with India. So if you look at all the progressive legislation of India, they did not apply to Kashmir because whenever you drafted a law in India, uh, pretty much, you know, clause 2 or clause 3 of that law would say, but this law is not applicable to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. So what you had was, you didn't have right to work, you didn't have right to education, you didn't have right to information, you did not have affirmative action, uh, you did not have uh, the law against domestic violence, you didn't have a uh, law on representation of women in local bodies, you didn't have equal, uh, you know, property laws between uh, men and women, you didn't have juvenile protection law. So, uh, I can cite to you at least about a hundred important laws which did not apply to Jammu and Kashmir. Now, one was a political consequence, the uh, economic consequence, the second was a social consequence. But one and two really led to three, and that was a political consequence. Because what all of this it did was, it allowed really... Uh, and knowing that the region is massively invested in cricket with Afghanistan and Bangladesh now emerging too, but between India and Pakistan, often the countries stop when the two nations play each other. There's a rivalry for sure. Can this not be a, a source of um, a rapprochement, uh, as seeing as it touches the two countries at the very deepest level? Uh, you know, I must tell you, uh, when I look back at the last few years, one um, little thing which I did, which I'm particularly proud of, was to help find the Afghan national team a kind of a home uh, cricket base to actually uh, develop the team, which happened to be a suburb of Delhi. Uh, and when I look at them today performing, I identify almost as much with them as I do with my own team. But the answer to your question about uh, India-Pakistan uh, cricketing linkages, it's very difficult in real life uh, to separate issues. Uh, now, if you if you see some of the uh, very difficult things which have happened between India and Pakistan, I mean, we had uh, you know some years ago an attack, a very major attack on an air base in India. Uh, then, I mean, this year we've had the, you you had in 2016 uh, an attack on a military camp which killed a lot of people. Uh, this year we had a suicide attack which killed a lot of uh, policemen. If the, the dominant narrative of a relationship is of terrorism, suicide bombings, violence, then you say, okay guys, now tea break, let's go and play cricket. I think that's a very hard narrative to sell to people. So there is, there is I mean, look, this is a democracy, sentiments of people do matter. Uh, and uh, I, the one message I don't want to give is, you do terrorism by night and it's business as usual by day. You know, and unfortunately, that's the message I would give if I were to follow this path. Question. Uh, uh, it is, uh, I don't know if you know, we have, there's a, there's a national organization uh, of great influence and uh, uh, recognition weight in India called the Jamaat uh, Ulema Hind. They just had their annual meeting and they have spoken up very uh, clearly in uh, favor of the changes which are uh, which are envisaged in Kashmir. I don't think, I mean, my, my first uh, response to you would be, I would not, uh, I would not agree that the, the Kashmir issue should be seen through a, a communal lens. Okay. My second uh, observation would be that if you look today at the changes in India, I mean, uh, I uh, probably the word I can, which captures it best for me is, you know, India is modernizing in a very interesting way and it's not necessarily state driven, okay. I mean, to me, uh, anything the state does is overshadowed by what the smartphone does. I mean, if you, if you look today, the, the, you know, the moment people have money, 
the first thing they do, I mean, when I had money, I first dreamt of buying a car. You know, someone today who's 16, 17, 18 would think of getting a phone and improving the phone. So, uh, to, you know, you are seeing a more urbanizing society. Um, in that sense, uh, uh, society which is uh, interestingly more meritocratic. It is, it is, uh, the the uh, the social gains are spreading, but at the same time, it's also mixing up. There's a lot of internal mobility which wasn't there before. So, I would actually predict to you that you would have a society increasingly where traditional identities matter uh, less than they uh, did in the past. Uh, in terms of, you know. Of how do we approach uh, the Indian state or the political party, uh, the ruling political party? Look, uh, today if there's one area where we have, we can boast of visibly good relations, uh, particularly in the last five years, that would be the gun. And you know the, the dominant faith in the gun. I think they see it because they, there is an objectivity about them and a, and a sort of a, uh, they don't have vested interest in a, what is a, essentially an Indian domestic discourse. So I would not, uh, I, I would not be comfortable with the view that somewhere we are headed for some kind of collision uh, with the with the uh, Muslim community globally. I don't think that. When we were talking about collision, we were talking about. I I think that if you forgive me, I, we have to bring the session to a close. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming and being part of this tonight. <laughs> I want to particularly to thank you.